the purpose of the discussion is not to focus on the negatives, but to talk instead about solutions and about how we can use this crisis as an opening to advance a bold left demands for workers' rights and economic and social justice in both Vermont and across the United States and even the world. So on that note, we're gonna open this up to our first uh, panelist. So our first panelist is going to be Abel Luna. Abel Luna is with Migrant Justice and Migrant Justice is a grassroots organization uh, founded and led by immigrant dairy farm workers here in Vermont. And their mission is to build the voice, capacity and power of the farm work community and to engage community partners to organize for economic justice and human rights. Thank you for joining us, Abel. Yeah, thank you guys for, uh, for inviting us uh, to be part of this uh, presentation and part of the panel. My name is Abel Luna. I'm an organizer with Migrant Justice. Um, and uh, you know uh, we're living in a in a time of crisis right now. What does it mean, uh, um, you know, for farm workers that they have been deemed essential? Um, well, you know, it means that farm workers have to continue to work, get up every morning, show up to work, milk the cows, um, and make sure that food is uh, put on the table. Um, and that means that they have continued to continue to do that work um, with um, with the conditions that that they're currently you know facing with you know um, lack of uh, protective equipment. Um, uh, a lot of like overcrowded housing, uh, some um, you know people living in, in cramped housing, shared housing, um, and you know some of some of those issues. Um, at the same time, you know like uh, you know, people are say, people are, have to go to work. Um, they have to feed uh, the country. But at the same time, we have been excluded uh, from some um, from um, some of the the aid that is coming from the government, uh, like the uh, stimulus checks that are come to hundred dollars um, and the unemployment benefits. Um, you know, uh, but we're not just like, you know, uh, with our, our arms crossed, um, we're organizing and we're, um, we're making sure that uh, Vermont is having the conversation on how to protect farm workers uh, in this time of crisis. Um, and we are, we have two main sort of two main demands or two main things that we're, um, that we're working on. Uh, one is healthcare access and economic existence. Um, so uh, on healthcare, um, you know, it's great that uh, there's free testing, but the treatment is not. Uh, if, there's, um, if there's any related treatment to uh, COVID-19, it has to come out of workers' pockets. There's no, uh, there's no support around there. Um, and that's all we, uh, the, the state strategy of expanding Medicare to get more people is, uh, in short, it's good, uh, but it leaves out migrant farm workers, people that are making sure that the uh, dairy stays afloat. Uh, and there's a new need to cover a uh, treatment, right, uh, for ineligible people. Um, and also to expand the uh, um, emergency Medicaid program, um, you know, that uh, right now is reimbursing some uh, emergency treatment uh, for immigrants who are otherwise eligible for Medicaid. Um, and a lot of states like Massachusetts, New York, Oregon have expanded this Medicaid um, emergency uh, to cover COVID treatment. Um, and so, you know, that's something that Vermont can get behind and Vermont can also do this um, in the broadest possible way. Um, and so those are some of the things that we're looking at when it comes to, to uh, access to healthcare. Um, uh, that's how migrants are being impacted. Um, basically, there is no um, viable option for migrant farm workers, you know, uh, to receive uh, support. Um, and then uh, on economic assistance, um, you know, uh, migrant workers you know, pay taxes, uh, local and state taxes, but they will not benefit from, you know, like we mentioned, the stimulus checks um, and the unemployment insurance. Um, and you know, migrants are still working, uh, and the, the their industry is going to take a hit. Probably going to be reducing. Um, reducing some hours. Uh, there's going to be some milk dumping. We already um, uh, heard that there's milk being dumped already um, and some fa farms might be might be closing and so there's a financial crisis that's going to just continue to, to get worse. Um, so we need to get more money into workers pockets um, right um, and make, make sure the workers are protected um, and the state of Vermont should use uh, the care funds to create immigrant workers stimulus funds um, you know, to make sure um, workers are, are receiving these benefits as well. Um, there are already some models that exist, um, you know, to create funds accessible to immigrant workers that otherwise, you know, have been excluded. Um, you know, in Texas, um, in New Jersey, um, and other cities have already allocated some, um, you know, millions of dollars as funds to make sure that uh, immigrant communities are protected. Um, in Vermont, we're, we're, you know, demanding that Vermont also establishes um, you know, these kind of funds with the fewest hurdles possible, um, you know, uh, for documentation of eligibility 
um, you know, it's a scary moment and migrant farm workers, um, you know, are scared of even asking for some, for some of these services. And, and if there's like a lot of paperwork and a lot of these things, people are not gonna like tap into re these resources. So it's important that whatever, um, you know, um, aid comes out, uh, that people can have access to it. Um, you know, um, and we also, um, so, so, so that's some of the, of the things that we're looking into right now. Uh, we're in many conversations uh, with uh, the Vermont legislators and senators um, and with other organizations as well, like uh, the, Vermont, uh, the AFL CIO, um, and we completely support the AFL CIO and their hazard pay or crisis pay, um, you know, campaign to make sure uh, that you know, workers are, are getting money. Um, and, you know, it's important, you know, we are workers, we're all workers in a time of crisis demanding what's right. Um, these are things that are already out there and should be re already be given to communities, uh, especially the communities most impacted, um, and, and, you know, and they're not. And so, you know, this is why um, we're standing together in solidarity, um, you know, making sure that, that the working class and, and migrant communities, uh, you know, are, uh, they have dignity um, and are taken care of in this time of crisis. Um, you know, um, we are, we continue to do to do the work, the organizing work. Um, there's going to be a May Day um, uh, rally, not a rally, but it's going to be uh, people getting into cars. Um, so, uh, like sort of that that kind of action, um, sort of um, you know, like the driving and it's stopping at different places, uh, and that includes different groups um, across you know Vermont and the work worker center and other organizations, like Injustice, etc. Um, in our way of showing solidarity, um, but we're, we're still here, we're still standing, um, and, and yeah. Thank you, Abel. So next up we have, um, next up we have Molly Walner from AFT. Molly is a registered nurse at the University of Vermont Medical Center in Burlington, Vermont. She's a union member of AFT, and she works in the hospital's resource department, which helps support the COVID units. She's been working at the University of Vermont Medical Center for seven years. Thank you for joining us this evening, Molly. Can everyone hear me now? Is... Hi, okay. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Molly and I just want to make it clear, I am an AFT member. I'm not in a official role within the union other than a member at this time. But yeah, I do work at the hospital currently. And as you can imagine, um, it's a bit of a stressful environment depending on the day there. Um, the COVID patients are, are in the hospital and have been now for a few weeks. So there's been a number of issues that nurses have um, had concerns with. Um, I guess the first one I would mention is that some nurses in the outpatient areas, their clinics or um, outpatient settings obviously had to see decreased numbers or go to telehealth. So some nurses have been redeployed in other areas. Um, it sounds like most of that was optional or whatnot. Some maybe were furloughed. The other thing that's come up is that most nurses at the medical center right in Burlington um, take buses to get to work because there isn't enough parking on site. And obviously with social distancing, that is that was of concern. Um, so now, especially because UVM is out of school, we've been able to park on site, which has eased a lot of people's concerns there just with traveling into work, not having to do in masses now. Um, another thing is, is protective equipment, personal protective equipment or PPE, which probably almost everybody has heard about in the news. And um, our hospital, like m most, if not all hospitals, are definitely concerned for not having enough. Um, so I would say nurses at along this journey have been concerned as far as if they're getting protective and protected enough while being on the front lines from my experience and what I've heard. Um, Cause like I said, I support the COVID unit units. I'm not there every day, but I do help support them as needed. Um, thus far, it seems that there has been enough protective equipment. However, we're, we are um, trying to be strategic in how much we use each day to limit the risk of running out. And our management has indeed um, been trying to keep us in the in communication about 
who they are teaming up with locally to also try to help supply. They've had a number of local suppliers that have kind of stepped in and have sent some shields and face masks and that kind of thing. So that was neat to see some of the collaboration there. Um, and yeah, I mean, I would say generally protective equipment is the biggest thing. Um, it does seem that nurses that maybe were not necessarily wanting to be on taking care of COVID patients because of other reasons, whether it's their underlying, their own health or the health of others that they care for or have in their family. Um, it seems to me that for the most part, from what I've heard, um, nurses have been able to be reallocated elsewhere, though there may be exceptions to that. Um, and I think in general, the protective gear has been the biggest thing. But like I said, it seems like that's an issue all over the nation. Um, and luckily, it actually seems like our community has been able to step in in ways that maybe other places haven't to help fill the need. Thank you, Molly. So next we have Jeff Crosby. Um, Jeff uh, is connected with IUE CWA Local 201 in Lynn, Massachusetts. Um, this is the, uh, the local that recently did the job action calling on GE to convert aviation plant to begin manufacturing ventilators. Thank you for joining us, Jeff. Thank you, uh, and I'm really sorry. I have a 6:30 call, so I have to talk and then, and leave. So I'm going to miss the rest of this, and I apologize for that. Um, so the GE plant is about 1,250 um, union members in local 201. When I started in '79, there I worked there for 33 years. I had 8,700. In the course of that, they've lost like a lot of what used to be like the upper economic sector of working class people. There still is, but has lost their pension, for example, has lost, uh, they started $10 an hour, then went lower than what they used to, and eventually still get to the top rate. So our basic thing I'll talk about is right, right, flipping the script. And I think people know, or sort of have the sense of that in um, any capitalist crisis, and in particular with uh, this kind of crisis, um, you know, not just an economic problems, but also a something like this pandemic, um, they come out of it and strengthen themselves every which way that they can. And it's the kind of stuff that Naomi Klein talks about in Shock Doctrine. And so what I want to talk about is, is, is reversing that. So yeah, they're going to consolidate. Amazon's hiring 175,000 people. Lots of small businesses aren't going to make it. But we can come out of there stronger also. And that's within our power. And there's three things I'll mention there. Um, the main one is just our own organizations. And at GE and Lynn, they've been really working hard at that. The principal issue is really protecting their own lives. Um, you know, the, the issue about building ventilators is important. Most workers are more concerned immediately because there's no layoffs at our plant with just staying alive. Um, the way they've been fighting that is adopted what they call a 5S program that they just beat on again and again. If you go to local201.org, you can follow all the flyers if you're interested in that and what that means. It's basically a safety program. And they've tried every which way that they can to make this something that involves and builds the organization. So they've done mass um, grievances where you don't file a grievance, you just, um, everybody signs on individually. So hundreds of people are individually committed to a grievance. They've done job actions, they've emptied buildings, walkouts multiple times um, on Say, using um, national OSHA law, but also we have a safety agreement where you can refuse to work in an unsafe job. And in the course of these kinds of tactics, um, they've built their organization so that, for example, the emergency text network had 200 people on it. Now it's 750 or more. So a majority of the plant is signed into that of the members that are hooked into it. Um, they've also got um, uh, the, um, we've also got some contacts to new organizing, which is also possible. The problem there is people are calling because they're starting to see that workers need their own organization to defend them. No one else is going to do it. So that's kind of the, the key thing there is can we come out of this stronger? And I actually think we can as hard as times are because the level of activity around simply trying to protect ourselves on the job is like walkouts. I've never seen anything like this. Just one example, I talked to the head of 1199 New England, the healthcare union. 
they've had walkouts and job actions at, at more than a third of the nursing homes that they represent. We see this stuff all the time. The question is, how do you consolidate within that? You know, so how do you build something within that? So when this is over and someday it will be, um, we're actually stronger. The other two things just to mention very quickly is um, the uh, state, state and higher level demands. So for the international is the ones who's been pushing, they've been generally supportive. It hasn't always been the case with our local. They're pushing the ventilator stuff the most because there's a lot of plants that are laid off. And people believe in that, people want that, and people support that. And that also gives you a powerful thing to sort of orient your union towards what people call a common good organizing. And like you see in a lot of public sector unions, but even in something like a defense plant, we can shape our demands and something that our members care about. And also that puts ourselves on the right side of things positively in, in terms of the public eye and links up with other workers who also, especially healthcare workers in this case, whose needs we can actually meet if we were given the opportunity to do that. Um, that goes on at, at different levels of what can we collectively as a labor movement reach? Can we, is this a real time to make a breakthrough on healthcare for all? And those kinds of things um, that probably the most winnable, the number of states, Connecticut, Massachusetts were about to win here. I think they already won in Connecticut a moratorium on uh, rents and, and eventually mortgages. And then the third area, which I'll just sort of touch on is, uh, it's much harder for me to get my brain around is, um, the ideological things like what what consciousness is going to be changed when this is over i think there's things that it's hard to see but um if you think about what occupy did you know there was after the 2008 crash and people and occupy made everybody understand there's a 99 percent you know black lives matter sort of resurfaced issues of police and folks of color and stuff like that the me too movement changed people what's going to happen after this and my my expectation if we're able to, to consolidate on this is that the sense of working class having some self respect as a class of people and that the fact that we need to organize and protect our own selves because no one else will. Um, people are talking about all kinds of invisible workers, um, migrant workers that you just heard from Apple, obviously healthcare, grocery store workers, people that nobody gave a shit about for the last 100, 200 years. All of a sudden, everybody's talking about it. I think that's going to be a, a sea change and something that will be to our advantage, even in these really desperate times. So those are three pieces or levels of how we're trying to flip the script and come out stronger with this. Thanks for your time. And I'm really sorry that I won't be able to stay the whole time. I'd love to follow up with anybody who, who uh, would like to, and thank you. Thank you for joining us, Jeff, and for, for jumping in even for a bit. Um, and uh, there's some info about Jeff's union that was posted in the, uh, in the chat. People want to learn some more. So next up, we have Andy DeSell from UE Local 203. And Andy is the financial secretary of that local. Andy's a grocery clerk and union steward at the City Market Onion River Co-op in Burlington, Vermont. He's new, new to union organizing, but passionate about labor organizing. So thank you for joining us, Andy. Thank you so much for having me and for organizing this panel. Um, a little about our, our local. Uh, we have 229 workers in our bargaining unit. We've been a, a local for a little over 20 years. Um, Unfortunately, we don't know more about that history because we do have a pretty high turnover. Um, our average wage is fourteen forty-eight an hour, and in the past, we have struggled to uh, kind of develop militancy in the the workforce um, because of that high turnover. Um, but a, a silver lining of this pandemic has been that um, we have been able to channel some of the the fear and anxiety that um, all of us are feeling right now into some successful actions. Um, in early March, we were doing totally record-breaking sales as everyone was stocking up. Um, the shelves are pretty much empty. Um, and we noticed that uh, one of our sibling unions, uh, UE255, uh, they represent the Hunger Mountain Co-op in Montpelier, uh, successfully negotiated with management for hazard pay. And we uh, endeavored to do the same. Uh, we had three main demands of management. We asked for hazard pay. We asked for sufficient physical and uh, protection uh, in uh, allowing us to, to socially distance during this crisis and increase safety and security. Um, we met with the management over a six day stretch in late March. Uh, we met with them three times. Uh, initially, we asked for time and a half, uh, which I still think we deserve. But management, of course, blocked at that. 
they came back with an offer that amounted to a little under $2 an hour, which was below the national average. I think uh, Whole Foods by that point had already offered $2 an hour to their employees uh, as hazard pay. We came back and asked for five and were told that that was uh, fiscally unsustainable for the co-op. Um, at that point, we launched a social media campaign, uh, primarily on Facebook and Instagram, which was uh, very successful for us. Uh, a couple of our posts were shared over 2,000 times. And we uh, had about 100,000 impressions. Um, and because the, the co-op is, is interested in, in saving face and, and uh, having a positive image in the community, um, that really moved management. Um, they came back and offered us $3 an hour uh, for a six week stretch and we came back, asked for it for, for seven weeks. That covers um, from the declaration of emergency on the 13th until May 8th, um, at which point our uh, memorandum of understanding will expire. Um, so we're gonna be back in uh, negotiations with management at that time. The governor has extended the state of emergency to the, the 15th of May, I believe. Um, so we're gonna be, be doing it again in a couple weeks now. Um, but yeah, despite the, the, the fear and anxiety that, that we're all feeling right now, it, it did allow us to, um, to really strengthen our internal organizing in a way that wasn't possible before. Thank you, Andy. So next up, we have Nolan Rampey. Nolan is with AFSME 1674. Nolan is a longtime socialist and political activist. He currently works as a clinician at the Baird School and is on the executive board of the union at the Howard Center. Thank you for joining us, Nolan. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, so yeah, just to talk uh, a little bit about kind of what things are looking like uh, at, at Howard Center, um, which is the designated mental health care agency for uh, the, the area. Um, basically, any services um, except, uh, with, with the exception of a few services, everything has moved remotely. Um, and so uh, they've had the staff basically be pared down to all but the most uh, essential, which means there's large sections of workers right now that we're doing face-to-face -face care work with clients um, that, that aren't right now. Um, now to uh, Howard Center's credit, you know, they are actually at this moment continuing to pay all of the wages and salaries for workers, regardless of whether or not they are currently working. Um, in addition to that, uh, they are offering for the programs that are remaining open, which are the residential programs where there are clients that are in our care 24 seven, um, those workers are getting time and a half uh, wages and salaries. And then um, in the event that we have a client who is diagnosed with COVID, um, anyone working with that client will be receiving um, double pay during that time. So those are, you know, those are all great things. Um, and, and we're happy to see that. Um, so right now, um, I'll, I'll kind of come back to that in just a minute with um, kind of where we go from here. Right now, what our union is focusing on is making sure that the workers who are still working with patients or with clients right now have the necessary PPE. So right now, Howard Center has um, some supplies of, of masks. These are a mix of surgical masks as well as cloth masks that have been um, handmade, but they're, they are very transparent about the fact that they don't um, have that for forever, um, that it's a limited supply right now. And so the union's undertaking a mask production and distribution drive in order to be able to ensure that our workers uh, continue to have the protective equipment that they need. Our hope is that in the event that we can, you know, get that supply met, we would really like to continue with mask production um, and be able to start to actually set up distribution points in the community, um, ideally in like, uh, you know, areas like the Old North End or other places where people maybe don't have as readily available uh, masks and be able to set up distribution points to hand those out. Um, but we're still in the very early stages of that. Um, the other thing is that there's still, even within the programs that are open right now, there are really serious staffing shortages. And so we are trying to encourage any employees that are not currently working to make themselves available for redeployment to make sure that the clients that we care for um, have 
all of the, you know, all of the support that they need during this, during this crisis right now. Um, so those are kind of some of the immediate things that the union's doing to organize right now. I think the big question for us that we're thinking about long term and would love to be able to discuss now is uh, what it's going to look like to be able to push, you know, state and local governments to give the kind of funding that we're going to need to help get out of this crisis. Um, as I said, you know, the agency is right now covering wages and salaries for everyone, but that is, you know, it's not a given that that's going to be able to last forever. And a big part of that is going to be the kind of emergency funds that we get from the state. And I think it's a, pretty much goes without saying that without significant organizing and mobilization, both among Howard Center workers, but also the you know workforce and other designated agencies to actually put pressure behind those demands that we, the state will almost certainly shortchange us. Um, and then we'll be dealing with some more serious consequences and fallout from all this. So that's what we would love to, you know, love to be able to talk about more um, is what that's gonna look like moving forward. Thanks. Thank you, Nolan. So next up, we have Ellen Lalish. Ellen, uh, Elizabeth, sorry, Elizabeth Lalish. And Elizabeth is a registered nurse and has been working at Cook County Hospital in Chicago for 10 years. She's also an active steward with National Nurses United. Thank you for joining us this evening, Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, and I really appreciate uh, participating in this panel about how people are fighting back and what next steps we need to be taking together, uh, because I think that's the critical discussion. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little about, and why I'm on the panel, um, uh, to build off of what Molly had talked about and obviously other essential workers um, who are on this panel as well about some of our fights, what is it meant for our workers, um, not just nurses, but obviously hospital workers as a whole, um, and also what that means ideologically. I think some of the stuff that um, Jeff brought up is really important um, and sort of where, where we're going, right? Um, uh, as a working class, um, as radicals, as socialists, to, to go forward, to build opposition to what I think is a, a, going to be a long-term, you know, at least over the next year, uh, situation that is going to be um, much like now, fairly miserable for working class people um, and with the hope of fighting back. So um, I work at Cook County Hospital. It's the safety net hospital in the city of Chicago. It's um, the busiest hospital in the state of Illinois. Um, I'm also uh, uh, a survivor, I guess we call. I don't know what to say. I, I, I am COVID positive. I was. Um, I was on quarantine. Um, I recovered. Um, I got it at the hospital. Um, and I'm now, uh, I've returned to work back onto a COVID only unit of inmates at the Cook County Jail, which is the current epicenter in, uh, in uh, prisons uh, for the COVID outbreak. So it's a lot of layers of things that I personally am dealing with and my coworkers are dealing with um, in the situations in hospitals. So like what Molly said, um, on the front lines, I mean, a lot of the fights um, are building on things that have existed within the healthcare system um, prior to this, which is that our healthcare system based on profit has always been run on the cheap and based on money and not based on surplus. So our fights around staffing that we had you know, people may have heard about for a very long time from nurses, how we were short staffed, just became more and more acute now under the, uh, under the pandemic. And our big struggles have been around simple things, like other people around PPE, personal protective equipment, like a mask, an N95 mask, and having that be accessible readily for anyone to use, which is something three months ago we had, and now we don't. And it's very mind boggling and disconcerting. And it has brought up all sorts of things in my coworkers' minds about what is going on in a system that denies us something we had three months ago and why is that the case? So some of the battles we've done around N95s were around mid-February um, in the hospital. I'm a steward, I've been on the bargaining team and I'm part of the hospital nurse leadership, rank and file leadership there. Um, was we began to fight to have nurses, uh, the mask, the N95 mask, people have probably seen them. Um, that's the best possible protection we can have, not be locked up by managers 
when we need them for patients, which is what they were doing, right? Which is crazy. Um, so we had uh, a number of sit down, mini sit down strikes um, in the emergency room where a lot of patients were coming through um, because people, uh, our members did not have access to them. Uh, there was one incidence in which uh, nurses and doctors were trying to intubate a patient, put a tube, breathing tube down their throat so they could breathe. Um, and they, that was a potential COVID positive patient and they needed an N95 mask. Well, you can't do both things at the end, but the masks were locked up with the manager. You can't do both things at the same time. <laughs> you can't put a breathing tube down someone who can't breathe and get a mask, call the manager to get a mask. So people started having these sit down strikes and they were going into the break room when they were denied the N95 masks. And they would say, my chief steward said, you know, I will work, but I need this protection. And if I can't have it and you won't provide it to me and give it to me so it's accessible, I'll be in the break room. Find me there when you get it, I'll come back. And it worked. We got masks, boxes of them actually, given to the ER nurses. Um, and we had to do similar fights where I work, I work in medical surgical, which is kind of basic nursing, where we would be able to say, uh, we need the mask not locked up with the manager, but given to us in our medicine cabinet where we have the key, right? So our judgment on when we need them was the thing we wanted rather than when the manager would decide if we could reach them to give us the mask. So those are some of the, the basic things we've had to also fight and recently won that um, we would get paid sick leave. For example, I went on quarantine for 18 days and I was told that I would have to pay that out of my own sick time, which is thousands of dollars, right? And you know, there were questions from management about, well, maybe you got it out in the community. And it's like, we had to argue with them. There's no other place when you're an ask, uh, you're, um, we're going into essentially hospitals that are unfortunately United States Petri dishes for COVID-19 because there's been such a lack of a plan around how to contain that the only place that people could really get this who work in hospitals is likely, more than likely where they work and that it's the responsibility of management to pay for what they've done to us, which honestly, the stuff that's happening in hospitals without having PPE and just in general is probably the largest occupational um, health disaster that this country has ever seen in its history. I mean, bar none. Um, and there's been really bad ones that have happened in the past. Um, so those are some of the fights. I will say um, it has been very, remarkable to me, um, being it put in that situation as healthcare workers, where we're being asked to go in and actually deal with patients, and we readily do that. I'm sure people have seen this all over the country, but being denied this sort of basic protection that we had just several months ago, right, has really radicalized people. So they begin to ask the question about why don't we have ready access? What do you mean the distribution streams are held up? What do you mean the Trump administration is sending us stuff that's not good? And it actually brings up questions about the system we live under, under capitalism. It, they don't always say that, my coworkers, but they go, what are the priorities of a system in a pandemic that doesn't actually protect us? And why do we feel like for the system, it's okay if doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, everybody who works in a hospital could contract this disease and die? And actually, the, there are fairly high numbers. I mean, a study just came out um, where, you know, a good portion of healthcare workers, most of them are women um, and uh, who, which, you know, and older women, like 40 year old women are the women that are people that are dying who are healthcare workers. And that's the demographic of nursing in this country. So it's raising those questions. It's also that there was no plan. And so a system like this where Literally, we are fighting every day with something. Uh, there was a fight that we had about not putting COVID-19 patients in the same units as non-COVID patients. Literally three and a half weeks ago, we had an argument with my manager who said, of course we can, it's called cohorting. Of course they can be on the same unit. And we just looked at them like they were nuts. And, and the fact is that none of us have like degrees in epidemiology or you know, microbiology, but we know what it means to, you know, infection control means you can't have those things together, even with something like COVID, which of course everybody's learning about, but it seemed insane to us. And so we pushed back on that. Um, and then just basic education. Right now, 
we formed and in formation is a frontline workers council because we found that the management COVID, which is team, which is made up of doctors, is not transparent enough to us, doesn't give us information. There's really a lack of a plan. And we have pushed for there to be a council. And that really raises the idea of so like where people ideologically are at in the hospitals. It's like, why do we know how to do these things? But the people running the hospital seem so inept. Like it's a it's mysterious to them that these basic plans about you know, not cohorting patients, about having masks accessible, about, you know, a variety of other things uh, I won't go into because I've limited time. We know better than they do. And so it's raising questions about, all right, well, first of all, and first and foremost, we need to protect each other. So literally a bunch of us have bought our own PPE just as backup in case, right? And we help each other and provide that if it's needed. So we're all covered and protected when we go in with our COVID patients. The other thing is just people are like, well, we should be running this thing because it's clear that these people don't care about us, don't care about these patients. And therefore, um, you know, I'm not saying it's fully that people say we should take over the hospital, but there's a real question about that. And so it leads to the stuff about, I'll just end with this, that um, I'm currently involved also with a network nationally of nurses right now um, around the country. Today is our national day of action for healthcare workers. Um, I've been working with labor notes. People may be familiar with them. And so we're doing social distancing protests around the country in various, uh, outside of various hospitals. We're doing social media, um, you know, solidarity pictures. Um, and we're really pumping that sort of thing up. And we want to figure out how to coordinate that more because we feel that um, there are a lot of nurses unions and we want to come together as rank and file members to really press the federal government, first and foremost, and our own state governments and local governments to give us what we need. And we're calling for not only Medicare for all, we're saying there are calls for we should coordinate distribution of, of PPE, of ventilators, whatever we need, and there should be a nationalization of this health care system at some point, I'm not saying right now we have to get through it, but we should run that system as frontline healthcare workers, not somebody else, not, buddy, not, not somebody who's, who, I, you know, I go into these management meetings and they're like, oh, we have to reduce costs. That is no longer part of what we talk about in healthcare anymore as we go forward and go through this pandemic. We have to change the system. So, you know, what, what our feeling with this National Day of Action and one of our hashtags is hashtag, the system is broken and we wanna fix that. We wanna fix that as rank and filers and with our unions. And we wanna push away, you know, the corporatization of healthcare and it should be done for, for you know, a human right and not for money. So that's it, thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth. So next we have Tevya Kellman from the Vermont NEA the, uh, the Orange Southwest Education Association. Tevia is a high school history teacher, a member of Vermont NEA's Healthcare Council, and a member of the Vermont Worker Center Statewide Base Building Committee. Thanks for joining us, Tevia. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm just gonna tell you all before I get started, I've got a, a crappy internet connection and a two-year-old. So if either of those things interrupts my remarks, I apologize in advance. Um, so um, yeah, I wanna, I wanna try to talk a little bit about um, kind of what things look like from my position as a public school teacher and a uh, um, local leader in Vermont NEA, as, as well as from my perspective as a member of the Worker Center. And I'm gonna try to be really disciplined and, and uh, concise about each of those things, which is not always my strong suit. Um, I think, um, so in terms of what uh, folks who work in public schools are dealing with, um, it's, it's a really diverse range of experiences, um, which was true before this crisis, right? Um, you know, I think we, we organize both um, professional staff, you know, classroom teachers like myself, um, but also custodial workers, um, food service workers, in, in some locals, bus drivers, um, all in the same union. And conditions are really different um, depending on whether you're able to work from home or not. Um, so 
across the state and conditions are also different depending on the nature of the local school board. So, um, you know, I, I think there's a whole range of experiences, but um, the worst are, are, are pretty effed up. You know, um, we've had people being compelled to come into work um, through various forms of intimidation, through threats to, um, as I think, I think as Elizabeth was referring to, you know, having people burn up their sick time um, in order to avoid either infecting others or risking infection to themselves and their loved ones. Um, we're certainly, I'm not aware that there have been any direct attempts to push for layoffs, but definitely we're, we're feeling the austerity hammer being, I guess you don't sharpen a hammer, but whatever you do to a hammer before you strike, um, I, think, I think we're really bracing for um, an, an escalation and amplification of, um, I think in particular, attacks on support staff. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of the rhetoric before the crisis was about a lot of the paraprofessionals in school being perceived by school boards as kind of superfluous and, and dead weight. And now those are the people who are working for 14 bucks an hour to provide uh, child care to essential workers. Those are the people who are feeding the communities because, you know, I was teaching a district where um, the free and reduced lunch rate has gone from about 25% when I started teaching um, a decade ago to um, upwards of 50, somewhere between 55 and 60. Um, and I'm sure that's only going to escalate after this crisis. So those are some of the things that we're, we're dealing with. And I think, you know, among the demands that we're making in this moment of crisis are, um, you know, looking for hazard pay um, for people who are on the front lines. Um, we've got a petition out statewide um, to try to organize our membership to mobilize against any future layoffs or other austerity measures that are threatening to take uh, money out of people's pockets during this crisis. Um, I, I do feel like we need to do more, and, I, and I'll be very frank about that. I, I don't know that we're where we need to be, um, and I think to speak a little bit to where we need to be, um, or, you know, where I think we need to get to as a labor movement, and, and I'll, you know, save whatever critique toward, toward myself and my own um, union brothers and sisters to, to not make assumptions about what other folks are doing. But I think that we really need to move out of a mindset of what is going to um, bring us a win for our membership to seeing that our job is to fight against the forces of privatization and austerity and capital for the entire working class. And I think that as several panelists have alluded to, the conditions that, um, that we're all dealing with in different ways in our workplaces are making, making it possible for folks to see that in a way that was not possible before on a mass scale. And I think that we need to think about not just what do we need to win in this moment to keep people safe, although that is absolutely a priority that, that we need to lift up, but also how can we go on the offensive, right? How, how can we use this moment to build the kind of leadership um, that we're gonna need to build the kind of positive vision, you know? Um, and I appreciate what, what Elizabeth was saying about like, it may not be now, but we need to be talking about nationalizing hospitals and running them by the workers. And I think that that's the level of vision that we need to be seeding in our rank and file. Brian, how am I doing for time? Um, you're right on, right on the mark to wrap it up, actually. Okay, so I just want to, I want to just really quickly plug, you know, on, on the Worker Center side um, that I, that the Worker Center is, is really a vehicle for trying to organize um, poor and dispossessed people who do not have organized labor as a place to go. Um, and I won't get into all the details of that, but um, the Worker Center is also putting out um, a, a petition with a set of demands and trying to mobilize folks um, and, and escalate folks, really centering the call to expand Medicaid to everybody in this moment of crisis. And I think the last point I just want to make is, I think um, history has really shown us that it's easier to, um, to organize people to defend something we already have than to get something we don't have. And so I think we need to think about how can we use a moment of crisis um, this kind of shock doctrine on our side to, to get capital concede things that they wouldn't otherwise and then fight like hell to, to defend them. So, sorry to go over. 
Thanks, Tevya. Um, so next up, we have our last panelist, but not least, and it's David Van Dusen from the Vermont AFL-CIO. Uh, David is a member of the Democratic Socialists of America, and he's president of the 10,000 member Vermont AFL-CIO. He's also a member of AFSCME Local 2413 out of the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. Thanks for joining us, David. Thank you, Brian. The crisis has shown us, has laid bare the failures and shortcomings of our social system in the United States of America and in Vermont. <clears throat> that is absolutely the case. Now, the immediate response, there were some good things in Vermont and in other states across the nation and federally that came out of this. Uh, the extension of additional paid sick leave, the paid family medical leave, uh, certain waivers of co-pays with uh, COVID-related uh, health care coverage uh, or treatments. Those were good things, but those are things that should have been in place decades ago already. We should have already had secured those social benefits as a people, as most of the industrialized world uh, already has. So in our mind, while we still continue to struggle with the realities of the present crisis, and, and I don't mean to, to at all uh, understate the challenges we still face on the local levels. It is absolutely clear that the coming or uh, the emerging economic crisis is going to be massive. And the question becomes, uh, how do we address that? Now in 2008, uh, austerity largely was the way that we addressed that. And again, if we look at history, the left does not necessarily always have an advantage in times of economic crisis. That also becomes a time where the right wing and neo-fascism uh, also uh, sees rise uh, in its popularity. So we're seeing um, in Vermont, but across the nation, uh, demands beginning about austerity and cuts and, 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 and tightening, as they say, you know, the belt. And that's the last thing we need. What we need right now is immediately we need to be talking about a new deal. We need to be talking about a green new deal. We need to talk about massive public investment uh, into our infrastructure, massive public investment into our healthcare system, a massive rethinking of the social programs and the social benefits that all working people, uh, frankly, uh, deserve or should have a right to. This is what we need to be talking about now because we don't get on the offensive and seize the narrative. The other side is going to do exactly that. So this is where we need to be going today. Now, I recognize that the, the dozens and dozens and dozens of affiliated unions um, that the AFL-CIO is composed of in Vermont, I recognize that we are still dealing with very localized um, issues, uh, workplace safety issues, pay issues, furloughs that are coming down. And I know that we have to deal with those, but we can't take such a tunnel vision where we only are looking at those individual problems and failing to see the forest for the trees. We need now to start not just thinking about our self-interest for one group of 200 workers here or a thousand workers there. We need to be looking at the bigger picture. And when we talk about things like uh, what emerges out of us or what we should be prepared to do everything in our power to fight for coming out of this is not just the healthcare as a human right and nationalizing the healthcare industry. Yes, that's absolutely part of it. But right here in Vermont in Rutland, the GE plant, which is not unionized here in Vermont, um, over a thousand workers, instead of ramping up production of ventilators, uh, because they're driven by profit, right? What they have done is they laid off 60% of their workforce. Think about that. We have a pressing need for ventilators across the country, and yet GE, who has the capacity here in, in Vermont to produce ventilators, has chosen not to do that and instead to send people home without uh, paying benefits. Let that sink in for a minute. So we don't not we don't just have to nationalize the healthcare industry. We need to be in, uh, nationalizing other industries as well that refuse to serve the public good and instead put their profit over the needs of the people. And anybody that tells you uh, something other than that uh, are, are making apologies for a failed system that got us to the point we are now. So. Uh, Again, though, we don't do this individually. We don't do this one at a time. We have to do this as a group. We have to come together as a working class. We have to lay aside the distinctions between, oh, I'm in the AFL-CIO union, or 
uh, I work on a farm and, and, and we have our own different concerns. We are all one working class. So this is why we in the Vermont AFL-CIO, we made it very clear that all the gains that we need to be making now, both in the immediacy of the crisis and after, we need to apply to all workers in Vermont. And that includes undocumented farm workers. Uh, so, so this needs to be all of us because our strength is, is our unity. Our strength is when we are together. Our strength is when we don't settle for something less than what we actually need. Now, we'll see coming out of, uh, uh, Washington DC in the near future, I have no idea. I, I mean, I have no doubt is we're gonna see some lukewarm uh, moves to do a little bit of this or a little bit of that. But I'll tell you what, anytime my $1 goes to a big capitalist organization uh, to bail them out, uh, th that, that, that needs to become publicly owned. When Obama bailed out the auto industry, that may have been the right thing to do. But to then turn it back over and give it back to the capitalists after it was solvent, instead of using those profits for additional social spending, that is criminal. So that is the direction that the AFL-CIO feels we need to go, both in Vermont and across the nation. Thank you, David. So I just want to take a moment to remind um, our attendees that you can post questions in the question and answer, and they will be uh, collated and sent to me by uh, some of our helpers working behind the scenes to keep this moving smoothly. And speaking of our helpers, um, it would be good to just take a minute to thank everyone who's been involved in planning the event today and to point out that um, we have Democratic Socialists of America chapters in various regions of Vermont. And we're and, and just an open invitation to people out there listening today who may not be DSA members uh, to consider joining your local uh, D Democratic Socialist of America chapter. We've heard multiple participants talk about the importance of organizing right now. And uh, every two weeks I'm on the phone with DSA elected officials around the country hearing how all across the country chapters are organizing in, as, in response to the pandemic, not just through mutual aid, but also lists of demands and trying to uh, demand changes from the government so that we can address the systemic issues. So just consider uh, that an invitation. Um, or, and if you're not ready to commit and join, feel free to, uh, to attend our meetings and just check us out. So on that note, I'm going to shift to the questions. Um, I wish I had my drum roll sound effect cued, but I don't. Um, so let's see. So the first question, it goes to all of our panelists. Um, it's a question is, I have friends here in New Hampshire who need help organizing. If anyone can help, I'd appreciate it. We have a few organizations going here so far in Manchester, which have big potential to be of assistance to workers here. Thanks. So do any of our panelists um, have any suggestions about where a person can connect, who a person can connect um, within the Manchester, New Hampshire area? I will start by saying that there's a rights and democracy in New Hampshire. So I would encourage that people check out rights and democracy. Um, if a panelist wants to speak, if you could just like raise your finger or hand and I'll, I'll call on you. So I see David Van Dusen. I don't know if Tevia's child was raising their hand, but um, go ahead, David. Um, there, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about workplace organizing. If uh, you could put my contact uh, information out there, my email or cell phone number, I'd be happy to put them in contact with uh, an appropriate union, New Hampshire. Thank you. Anybody else want to add or is it? Okay. So the next question. Um, how can we spread the victory at City Market to all the other supermarkets in Burlington and in Vermont? At Hannaford's, they are getting hazard pay, but none of them have PPE and they are non-union. What about UE workers from City Market reaching out to all those workers and setting up discussion Zoom calls to spread the fight? That was their next question. Is, uh, would anyone like to respond to that or? Go ahead, Andy. You're on mute. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's a, a fantastic idea. I know our, our uh, national union rep, Abby Curtis, who's wonderful, did uh, reach out to some workers there uh, while on a personal shopping trip. Um, we are also struggling to get uh, adequate protective equipment. Um, we have a, a number of like homemade masks, which the community has donated, which have been a, a great um, great in the meantime, but we're not able to source uh, the, the kind of mass that we'd really like to have. But uh, certainly we should should all um, 
work together, all the grocery workers of Vermont and the world. And also, Brian, I would add that um, in addition to UE, the UFCW is also organized in Vermont too. I'm sure they would be happy to help organize anybody that is looking to form a union in a food in a grocery store. But uh, the statewide level, the AFL-CIO and allies, are, we are pushing for mandatory uh, crisis pay for all essential workers across Vermont. So we'll be pushing that um, in the coming weeks, continue to do that. Hello, everyone. Okay. Was I the only one who got kicked out of that, out of here for a minute? Okay, so I'm gonna just jump back into the questions if that's okay. Um, so Andy, I missed your response, I'm sorry. I'll catch up later. Um, so, um, so we've got the next question, which is, uh, what can we do to get more unions to join the May Day action that Migrant Justice is organizing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, Migrant Justice is sort of like taking the lead in, in uh, organizing the May Day rally, the car rally. Uh, so if you have any questions, I mean, it's open for everybody that wants to, to be part of the, of the rally. And as you know, the more people can turn out, the better, um, the more, you know, the more pressure that we can sort of put on the different issues that, 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 that we want to talk about. So um, it'll be, um, so May Day, uh, just send an, if, uh, an email to infomigrantjustice.net. I left the email down on the, on the comments, um, uh, answer the question. Um, but yeah, it'll be a, a car rally. We're super excited about it. Um, and they can, yeah, just reach out uh, via email and we'll give you more info on the stops. Um, Vermont Worker Center will be uh, organized, will be um, joining us and I think uh, AFL CIO on some on some of the parts, uh, so there's like spots that we're gonna be stopping by, like uh, the hospital. Um, we're gonna be going to a Hanna Ford's, um, and so yeah, different places um, to highlight some of the issues that we're uh, different groups are working on. Thanks, Abel. So the next questions are for Elizabeth. Um, so prepare yourself. Uh, let's see. We've got. I'm gonna. I'll, I'm gonna read the th the four questions to you, and then you can answer them how they fit, and I can repeat them if needed. Um, they're connected. So it's how did the National Day of Action for PPE go? How many nurses unions participated? And then the second piece is how can that be escalated and expanded? And how can our nurses union join that struggle? So as far as how did the National uh, Day of Action for Healthcare work, it's still, it's today. So once I'm done on this call, I'm going to our action at shift change at 7.30 p.m. at my hospital. So, um, and I know there's another action uh, at least um, in Michigan. So um, I would look to uh, Labor Notes, which is going to be doing, hopefully people are familiar with that. I mean, I can, I can put it in the chat. Maybe we could share it. They're, they're compiling how it looks around the country. In New York, they had a couple of... Um, they had something this morning in Brooklyn, which looked about 50 nurses were there, healthcare workers. There's some fantastic videos um, that I know that Labor Notes will be sharing, as well as um, there are were some actions uh, more like in the hospital, uh, what we call rounding. Uh, different nurses came together and talked about the National Day of Action at Jacoby, which is in the Bronx, um, and that's a public sector hospital. Um, I know there are other things going on throughout uh, the, the, the local in Pennsylvania, um, PASNAP um, has uh, all of its locals are participating. I think it's a dozen. So it's in process right now. It's something that's brand new. We're also getting quite a bit of solidarity. We've asked people to put photos in solidarity. So we're getting a bunch of educators from across the country. Um, many, you know, number of them were actually involved in the strikes over the last, uh, year and a half, two years since 2018. So that's possible, uh, that's really positive. Um, and how many, it's, it's probably about in cities, maybe a, how many unions, maybe about, um, I'm in National Nurses United, NISNA 
HAZNAP, uh, Michigan Nurses Association, um, SEIU 1021, which is in the Bay Area, where I was doing some probably at least a half a dozen nurses unions. Um, and we've been trying to work more together um, to be a, a force, right? To, I think right now is the time of solidarity and moving beyond, I think people get that, beyond just individual union members' concerns. Um, and we would love for you to be involved. And the, net, the escalation, we're gonna have a discussion um, about it. We've been having calls um, every week for the National Nurse Network. So if you want to, whoever that is, or if anyone, uh, they, they can contact me directly and I can get you involved. We'd love to have more nurses unions involved. And um, I think we'd probably escalate. There's going to be some real discussion and beginning to be discussion when, with all the talk about opening back up the economy, right? And going back to work and what does that mean? I mean, there's some real serious concern I think we have as healthcare workers about how that's gonna be done. So I could see that as being a potential point of escalation. So, um, but we haven't fully talked that through. That's me and, and my idea. So hope that answers. Are those all the questions, Brian? Yeah. I believe you hit most of it. Um. Yeah, and so you know, look, look to labor notes. It's labornotes.org. They will have a, a, a roundup of all the different actions I've been asked to, uh, you know, contribute something tonight. And I think they want to get it up by tomorrow or the next day. Thanks. So um, speaking of PPE, the next question um, is for Abel and it's related to PPE. The question uh, or these series of questions are, do farm workers need PPE? Would it be helpful to have a drive to collect PPE and um, for workers to prevent spread of disease at their workplace? And um, it, or if that's not what's needed, what would be the greatest need for help from the community for the farm workers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, just like to some some context. Uh, yeah, like a lot of you have, have pointed out before the before this crisis started, um, there were very little protections to begin with. Very like little like mask and, and goggles and things that you wear, um, you know, to protect yourself from chemicals and, and other like things on the farm. Um, and so now with, with all of this happening, it's impossible to find masks. We have been talking to some workers who, um, you know, they don't have any masks or gloves or none of that. Um, you know, the workplace. Um, and so, yeah, that is one of the, the things that um, if there is, um, a, you know, a, a way to collect masks, um, you know, we're hearing from different different farms and different workers, uh, and that'll be great. And we'll, um, you know, we can reach out to them and then we can make a plan on how to, how to get those masks to workers. But that'll be great. I think that's one of the things that, um, uh, yeah, farms are not prepared with. Some farms are doing the best that they can, um, but the majority, uh, yeah, they don't have uh, personal protective equipment. So that'll be, that'll be great. Um, there are other things, for example, um, uh, you know, like farm workers um, that are might be losing hours or parts farm workers that might like be losing like housing, for example, and all of that. Um, and, you know, we're trying to like figure that out, but that goes more with like the plan with the state that we were sort of talking about and how to push them. Uh, but yeah, I think like, Mask will be like if there are different groups or, or uh, people that have you know if there are possibilities that'll be great. Um, I, uh, you can send an email to info at migrantjustice.net and uh, connect with us and we can sort of reach out to you uh, to see how we can get those masks. Um, and the other one, the other need, I guess, uh, since you mentioned what other needs is that you know I mentioned the, the May Day rally, so I think that'll be important not just for migrant justice but for a lot of organizations and, and groups that want to highlight the issues that we're working on. Um, you know, if you can turn out, you can turn up, um, uh, show up, you'll be on a car, um, you know, people won't be exposed. Uh, so, I mean, we need people to show up, especially in this time of crisis, uh, it's important, people's power. Um, and so, yeah, those are some of the things that, that we're asking for. Um, yeah, and support whatever sort of bill or um, get sort of introduced or, uh, or we sort of get behind to make sure that workers are, are you know, are, um, get, get treated uh, and, and benefits. Um, Thanks, Abel. So the next question in round one, I will read. Before I read it, I just want to say, um, get your questions in the Q&A and they'll be sent for me for the second round. Um, so feel free to add some more questions. We have a little bit of time left. Um, so our, this question is, it's a, there's sort of like a statement followed by a question. So I'm going to read it. 
So it says uh, the Vermont state government and all the cities are going to run enormous deficits in the wake of the pandemic and recession. That will mean austerity measures against us and the predominant strategy of voting and lobbying will not stop that. We need to prepare unionized and non-unionized workers to turn to 1930 strategies to resist what will be enormous austerity measures. That means organizing strikes and protests. And here's the question. How can we begin the process of organizing to do that? Who do you want to answer that? Right. I think that's open to the panelists. If you'd like to speak on this, uh, just signal and I'll call on you in order. Did you want to start? Sure. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> whoever wrote the question is, is absolutely right. We cannot be afraid of strikes. Our, our actual power is in our labor. When we withhold our labor under normal circumstances, uh, we have the ability to shut down society. Uh, all of the folks who are going to be arguing for austerity and for the interests of the corporations, they still rely on us. So we need to get there. But one of the ways we get there is we do need to get out of our silos. We need to be having these cross-union, cross-organization, union and non-union conversations as a working class to build that unity around um, a set of principles that we could agree to. And we have to be prepared to go outside of our comfort zone to support each other in our struggles. So we can't, we need to support, say the nurses at uh, UVM Medical Center or, or at Copley Hospital, but we also need to be having those nurses support the, the farm workers and the municipal employees in the different towns and different communities. And if we can be, if we could teach ourselves to be disciplined in our solidarity, there is very few limits to our power. It's by them keeping them the other, keeping us divided, that we cede our power uh, to a very small minority of people who otherwise would rather just pay less taxes, who have plenty of money, and, and really don't give a damn about the average working person as long as they have their um, fancy things and comforts. Would someone else like to um, add to that? Tevia, I see Tevia, I see Nolan. Okay, go ahead, Tevia. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with uh, the premise of the question and, and pretty much all of what Dave said. Um, I think one, one kind of concrete thing I want to offer is that I think that the demand for universal health care has the potential to galvanize across a number of organized industries as well as among the general public, you know, and I think that that's part of the work that the worker center sees is like organizing folks around the status of precarity with healthcare, which I think is clearly on the rise with mass layoffs coming. Um, and also because I think that the rising costs driven by the privatization of healthcare is really at the heart of, you know, that's what we're competing for, for that's what public dollars are competing with in many cases. Um, it's not the only driver, obviously, but certainly in the school system, you know, it's 20% of the state budget is going to Blue Cross Blue Shield. So I think that um, looking for strategic places to make demands that bring together um, sectors of the working class who otherwise will be pitted against each other if the demands are not broad enough or not speaking to those. And I would just throw out there that I think in this context, at this moment, Healthcare backed by the yeah the ability of of um, essential workers to withhold their labor with more leverage than ever, and I think that in different industries the logistics of that look differently. I guess one other thing I'll just throw out there is I think that the red red strikes that were alluded to earlier have definitely shown um, as well as healthcare worker strikes. I think like the um, the power of those sectors to really shut down society. Be because everyone has kids and everyone has hospitals, um, needs to use hospitals. And at least where I'm sitting, we're in a better position than ever to withhold our labor because we're already physically home in most cases. We've already solved a lot of the logistical problems of keeping kids fed and safe during a, a educator's strike. And, and so um, I think that, yeah, finding ways to support various um, connections between not just within sectors, but across sectors, I think is really key. 
Thanks, Tevia, and then Nolan. Um, yeah, so just to, I, I totally agree with what everyone's been saying. Just want to build off of that for, for just a little bit. I think it's, you know, the, the, the question and the, and the premise of it, you know, are, are 100% correct. I think it's really important that we understand right now that the, any time there's a crisis of the system, um, it represents an enormous opportunity because the status quo is no longer working. And so a new path has to be found forward. But it's not inevitable how that crisis is going to be resolved. That's a question of power. So does it get resolved in favor of working class people? Um, or does it get resolved in favor of the capitalists? And like the, 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 the question, the premise of the question talked about, the gains of the 1930s that came out of the Great Depression were only done through struggle, through strikes, um, and through massive mobilizations. That's what won that. So it wasn't an inevitable outcome, and it certainly won't be an inevitable outcome now. Um, and so, you know, we have to draw those lessons and start organizing. And so what I would just say in terms of like, you know, some of these like immediate next steps is that, right, our ability to win is going to be based on our level of organization in the workplace. That means for everyone who's already starting to draw these conclusions right now, we need to be having these conversations with our coworkers and organizing them to help, you know, and, and, and helping them to draw these same conclusions because people's ideas are up for grabs right now in a way that they, they often are not. And so I would encourage people to, you know, be talking to your coworkers and organize Zoom meetings, right? It's never been more, you know, easier in some ways to, to get people together because you can do these Zoom meetings. So everyone's concerned right now, get your coworkers together and start having a conversation around what the issues are and what you can be doing. And then I would say, you know, if, if you're unsure of how to do that or what that would look like, you know, reach out to one of us. Like, I think that's one of the reasons the Zoom call is so great. It's because it's putting, you know, giving people an opportunity to connect and trade ideas. And so if you feel like you need help with something like that, um, you know, certainly reach out. Um, and then, you know, just the last thing I'd say is in addition to the organizing within your workplace, right, I think people have touched on the absolute vital importance of organizing across workplaces in solidarity with one another. I think that there's been a long history, um, you know, over the past several decades of a tendency for workers to view their workplace and those issues and their organizing efforts as this bubble under themselves as though it's not relevant to other workplaces. And it, you know, crises like these that, uh, cross workplace boundaries, right, our national crises really show how we're all in the same boat and our opportunities to build that type of solidarity that can start to build towards both strikes and workplaces and general strikes that can create the kind of force that we need. Thanks, Nolan. Uh, Abel, did you have your hand up earlier for this? If you did, you can go next. And then I think I saw Elizabeth raise your hand just now too, so. And then there's more, there's a question for Molly. I see David's finger up. There's a question for Molly who hasn't spoken much during the question and answer. So let's get through you and then we'll do Molly's question if that's okay. So Abel, Elizabeth, David, and then we're gonna ask Molly some questions. Okay, go ahead. Well, yeah, very briefly. Yeah, um, and so yeah, around the, the organizing, it's more important than, than ever that all we have said it, yeah, we organize across um, sort of um, sectors and you know like farm workers with hospital workers and and just like everybody like this is this is that time where like you know um they're putting workers against workers you know like we're, gi we're giving you this and we're giving you this and we're giving you this but these guys don't get anything and so i mean it is basically like they're trying to like keep us apart keep us from talking to each other keep them from coming together and organizing to demand what we need and what it dignify right conditions and all of that and I think it's more important than never, you know, that this conversation is happening. This is a start um, where we want to go. And unless we're hearing each other's needs and understanding sort of like how each, um, you know, our, our own experience are it's playing out um, and understanding that and building from that, I think it's really key, um, you know, to build, you know, a, an economy that, that works for everybody and a, a dignified sort of system for all. And, um, and just like very briefly on the, on the mass question, um, you know, uh, reach out to us at the info email um, and we'll let you know what needs depending on which farms that we're hearing and um, most likely you'll have to mail them directly to that farm, uh, but we'll provide you all that information. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Go ahead, Elizabeth. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think people have answered this really well. It has to be across sectors. I mean, I've had, I've begun to have some discussions on Zoom. There are quite a few Zoom discussions amongst groups of unionized workers and non-unionized workers about how to organize. I think right now what we're seeing, the people most in the immediate are essential workers, as the phrase goes. So that does include farm workers, nurses, that includes grocery workers, Amazon workers. And so those people actually need a level of solidarity, I think in the immediate of support. And that's where you've seen strikes. For example, in Chicago, at one of the warehouse, Amazon warehouses about a week and a half ago, um, COVID positive employees were found, but management was not disclosing that to their employees until after several shifts in some cases. So what the Amazon workers who are not organized, they have, an, they have for about a year and a half in Chicago and across the country been try, trying to, you know, they're not, meaning they're not unionized yet, but they have, a, they have a worker organization and they have been fighting back. They had a social distancing protest outside of the warehouse here. And then they had a car caravan. And I realize we, uh, you know, you, that can go both ways, but it, it brought in allies from across the city, including the Chicago Teachers Union, which people may know is a, a very militant union and has struck before. But those people are at home, right? The teachers aren't teaching right now, as well as other labor allies. So that's the kind of thing about trying to show actual physical support. It is very challenging right now, obviously, because we have a pandemic and we're supposed to not be within you know, six feet of each other, how to actually do that. So that's a whole nother discussion. Um, and I think that it's important to see essential workers, um, you know, there's also a petition out that I have circulated, I know, uh, um, amongst trade, Trader Joe's workers who are also not organized, but have some really deplorable conditions and, and their safety is at risk, that sort of thing. So trying to figure out how to create those bonds now for strikes that are going to be Ha that already are happening and for the future. And then I think it's about looking in the immediate essential workers, but also what are some of the, I don't know, medium term demands. Like I know a lot of teachers who are like, what is this social distancing teaching thing? And you know, it's a, it's a whole question about like, what does that mean? And a lot is being put on educators right now, as well as other educators. I have a friend who's a part-time educator in Seattle who was told because he's part-time, he should go and do childcare you know, for part of the day with kids for six hours of the day. They fought back in Seattle and pushed that back. And they said unionized childcare workers should be doing that. So, I mean, I'm not, those aren't strikes, but those are beginnings of ways in which people are beginning to fight back. And so I'm, it's about looking at the immediate demands of essential workers, but also our longer term demands. Like I said, when I spoke, I just feel like this is going to go on for a while and the economy is crap. It will, it's, you know, worse than the Great Depression, we're going to be in a situation where we're going to have to figure out how to withhold our labor power and really make capital pay because they're going to try to take it out of us in every way they can. And so this is the time to come and solidarity is a real word. And it's about us really taking care of our, taking care of each other versus them. So either we survive or we don't. And I think we will. We just need to, you know, get, get to that place of real solidarity and figuring out how to, I mean, I've seen people using, you know, the, num the level of wildcat strikes in this country. I mean, who would have thought about that two and a half months ago? Like really, literally, that would have been a pipe dream. And it's a reality and people using that more um, and us unifying ourselves across as a class. Like what David was saying, I completely agree with that. That's the way we need to see this right now um, uh, in, in this current moment. Thanks, Elizabeth. David, would you like to comment before? Very, very on? briefly, <clears throat> very briefly, um, just to envision, and it's a long road to get to winning, but to, if we are to envision winning for a moment and what an, another new deal looks like, uh, we also have to envision what democratic empowerment will look like uh, coming out of this into a new social contract. One of the shortcomings of the old new deal in my opinion, is it did not build in um, additional avenues for direct democracy, whereby the great majority of the working class were more empowered uh, to defend the gains of the 1930s. So I, I just want to flag that now, as we need to also be speaking about democracy in ways that we could try to build a more participatory democracy in our society if we're going to fundamentally change it coming out of this crisis. 
Thanks, David. So we have about time for two more questions. There are a lot of a lot more questions that we won't be able to get to. So I'm sorry to those who um, who we don't get to your questions. But the next question is from Molly, who um, we haven't heard a lot during the question and answer from you. So um, I'd like to give you a chance to answer these questions. Um, can you talk more about how VFNHP pressured the hospital and UVM to enable staff to park near the hospital rather than being stuck together on buses? Many community members were shocked that this was an issue you even had to fight for. Yeah, um, so it's, it was something that what seemed like an obvious issue because everyone was talking about social distancing and how important it was. Yet to get to work, most people, unless they live really close and can bike or walk or that kind of thing or get dropped off by somebody, they park off site and then get shuttled in due to limited parking right at UVM's main campus. So it was something that the union definitely brought up as an issue, it seemed like an obvious one to bring up. And I know there was, we had a um, petition that was going around being signed. It seemed like they got a few thousand signatures there. And I mean, they've also just been really good in general about having town hall virtual to keep the members up to date on certain issues and to discuss certain topics of what might be troubling the members. But in any case, it did seem like something that was addressed in a fairly timely fashion. Um, it, it first was just an adjustment of they moved people to a closer on-site parking so the bus ride was almost optional, like it was almost close enough to walk if you felt comfortable doing that. Um, and then it actually is now that everybody's right on site and UVM with being mostly closed because the university finally announced that they're not going to resume um, their studies that people can now park on site. So I wasn't directly involved in getting that to all go through. So I might be missing some of the finer details, but it seems like it was something that with the petition and then in discussion, it, it, it took a little bit to evolve to completely what it is now, which is everyone's parking on site. But I think a lot of people are glad that we did get it all the way there. Thank you. So our last question, um, is um is for the whole panel and it is uh how can the environmental justice and eco-socialist community participate in these efforts uh, what would be um the next steps in our recovery from this pandemic in, in fighting for a green new deal so i see david um wants to start go ahead david To win, we need to have essentially what amounts to a popular front. We need to be uh, reaching across uh, not just sectors of labor, but sectors of interest into the environmental community. And for that to be effective, we have to have a common understanding. And a new deal, a green new deal, can't just be about uh, how many solar panels we put on roofs. It has to be about how many construction workers, uh, union construction workers are gonna be being paid a, at least a prevailing wage with family sustaining benefits in those jobs? And is the revenue gonna be raised progressively or is it gonna be raised regressively through things like a gas tax? So what we need is we need to reach across the aisle. We have to recognize the legitimacy of the concerns of the environmental community. A global uh, climate change is a real thing. We need to prioritize that as a fight we have to have, but we have to also have agreement from environmental groups and activists uh, that uh, work. the needs of working people will be baked in, will be part of that effort. So we have to build that mutual trust and we have to start to do that now. The AFL, we're gonna be on a call with a Vermont AFL, with the Vermont Sierra Club in a couple of weeks. And these are the kind of efforts we, we need to be doing right now. Would someone else like, yes, Nolan? Nolan and then Elizabeth? Um, yeah, I think that that's a, a really important question about the environmental movement. And I would just say that it's really important, I think, that we understand 
um, these two things about like what Dave was just talking about with workers, justice and social justice issues being intimately bound up with the environmental movement. Because one of the things that's gonna be happening, I think is during the course of this crisis in the aftermath of this crisis as the state tries to get the economy back on its feet, they are going to use the crisis and the economic damage it's caused as justification for loosening up environmental regulations for actually like even, you know, rather than actually solving it, actually making it worse and using the need to restore profitability as the justification for that. And so we absolutely have to fight every step of the way around what that's going to look like and that this actually again represents an opportunity that you know if if we have the type of power that we need to have it would be completely reasonable that as corporations get bailed out with massive taxpayer money that those could be taken over actually by the state and then reworked to be in environmentally friendly ways it's things like you know when the opportunity in 2008 when the auto industries were going under and were back bailed out, right? That was it actually an opportunity if we had wanted to, to shut down some of those companies and actually rework them to start making solar panels or to start building wind farms, right? Use the infrastructure and capacity of the car companies to do that. And of course that didn't happen because we didn't actually have the power to, to, to enforce that or make that happen. And so that's what we're going to have to do now. And so yeah, I would just say that, you know, we should absolutely understand the environmental movement as going hand in hand with things with with the issues of workers rights and what things are going to be looking like in the workplace moving forward. Thanks, Nolan. So we're going to let Elizabeth um, get the last word on this question and then we're going to just wrap things up because it's about 731. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, I, just briefly, I agree with what David and Nolan said. I also think that we have to refigure completely what a Green New Deal looks like. We will have more pandemics. The whole reason that this virus actually was able to do what it has around the world is because of climate crisis, because of what we've actually done. Um, if, you, if people read about it, um, to the planet, right? And how we've gone into areas um, that had, you know, isolated viruses that never really had an impact on the human body and things that were happening in China. And things like that. But it isn't just specific to one country. It's about what we've actually done to the planet. So we need to refigure as working people too, how we connect ourselves to argue for the kind of world we want and bring back, you know, the whole idea of fighting around you know, what people have said in the climate um, uh, environmental movement, the climate justice movement, that we, we are literally on a, a path to, you know, destruction 12 years. And so bringing that, that politic together and actually coming up with a common goal that doesn't have the opposition, right? I agree, they are going to try to deregulate and try to, they're gonna do all sorts of things to every industry to justify this stuff and even more and now is the time to actually bring those things together and say we don't ever want this not it's not you know i can say a whole bunch of stuff about the healthcare sector in this in this country but in public health but it's also about the environment and how that's impacted otherwise this would not have really happened to be honest with you if there had been more of an understanding of what climate crisis and global warming and what we've done um, as, as a human race to the planet. So we need to actually refigure all of that and say, we're not gonna have this happen again, right? This is not how we actually want the world to, to be and we don't want a global pandemic, but there will be more if we don't stop what's happening to the environment and what we're doing to the environment. So it has to be, you know, justice for our side, right? Because obviously the, the, the capital will go and do whatever it needs to for its, its short-term immediate needs. And we need to pull that back along with all the other things that people are talking about, about you know, refiguring a, an agenda that's for the working class in this, in this country, but also in the world. Thanks, Elizabeth. So, um, and thanks to all our panelists. I think you really illustrated the point with this last question about the importance as we move forward from this crisis of recognizing that we were living in an extractive economy that took advantage of labor and that took advantage of the earth. And this is a wake up call. People said we couldn't just stop everything. And nature said, hey, here's a virus practice. And now we're like, oh, okay, 
chance to reflect and, and move from an extractive to a regenerative economy and a chance to, to, to heal the earth and to take care of people in the process. And so thank you all. Um, and in, in the spirit of moving forward, I'm just gonna end with some announcements that this, this Friday, at 4 p.m. April 17th, there's a drive-by honk protest at the ICE facility in Williston, Vermont. Um, some people have been concerned about drive-by drive, drive -by protests shutting down healthcare facilities, um, but if there's any facility we want to shut down, it would be an ICE facility. So, um, so there is a drive-by honk protest this Friday. Um, uh, if you wanna know more information um, there, um, please, uh, maybe someone could post in the chat a link for people to follow up. And uh, the last announcement would just be in term, in the spirit of moving forward and organizing um, for a better world, we have our monthly DSA meeting coming this Sunday at 4 p.m. And the agenda will include next steps for the left after the Sanders campaign, as well as organizing around the COVID-19 pandemic. So pl please feel free to drop in to our DSA meeting this Sunday. You don't have to make a commitment. You can just show up and check it out. Um, and at that meeting, you can hear more about the working groups of the DSA and the various ways that your neighbors and community members are coming together in this time of crisis to try to usher in a better world. So on that note, we'll end it tonight. Thanks again to all our panelists. It was wonderful to have you all with us. Um, thanks to all the participants, the uh, attendees who stuck around. Um, and I hope everybody out there stays safe and healthy and as happy as you can considering the current situation and that you have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.